bird's eye view. Okay, that's fine. So you put it on the internet and it seems to work fine. Okay. You're on TV. I'm, I'm on TV right now. <laughs> I like that. Give us one more minute to wrangle up the speakers. How are you all doing this afternoon? Is it still raining outside? No. No. Okay, good afternoon. I want to make sure that, ah, there it is. See, I actually don't need amplification normally because I'm a pretty loud person, but we are webcasting, and I'm even not that loud. Welcome, my name is Jennifer Turner, and um, I direct the China Environment Forum here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Any of you who are new to the Wilson Center, we have a lot of great folks from the Asia Society website, so I always like to let people know. Wilson Center was created in 1968 by Congress as a memorial to our 28th president, and in his spirit, we try to bring together both the policy and the scholarly communities. In the China Environment Forum, we turned 13 this year, and we've been bringing folks from around the world together to talk about China's energy and environmental challenges um, very much. Over many years, I focused a lot on water in my own research, and, and obviously, being in with the, as the time's changing, I've had to learn a lot more about climate and energy issues, and um, today's topic actually um, intersects all, both these worlds um, that I work on more and more, the water and energy and climate. Um, but I do want to, you know, also again to welcome you for coming here today. This is a meeting co-sponsored by um, the Wilson Center and the Asia Society. And just to make sure that you're on the right airplane here, you are on the airplane that's flying to Asia's growing crisis and floods and droughts. This is not where you want to go. You can head out of the room, right? And you came. Hurrah. Um, and um, we're going to get, and, and I know a lot of you came today because you knew that there'd be lots of photos. Yes, we all like photos here in D.C. Not dry and dull presentations. We don't do that here at the China Environment Forum. Um, and they're going to be talking about glacier melt in the greater Himalayas. And this may seem like a problem that is, I mean, it is indeed geographically far away from us. But the impact that it's going to have on 40% of the world's population will be immense and potentially hold some security implications for the region, as well as, of course, human, human health crises and uh, damage to the environment. Um, and so what we have to, I was really thrilled when Orville Schell and his, his, his mafia gave me a call and said that they wanted to come on down here and bring David Brashears and Dr. Hasnan to talk about um, the melting glaciers, because it is a topic that it's not exactly front page news, but it should be. Um, Orville Schell is the director of the Center on U.S.-China Relations at the Asia Society. And if you haven't checked out their, on their website, they've got this really fabulous multimedia site called China Green. Uh, a new feature that just came up this week is they're comparing the air quality in New York and Beijing every day. You can see pictures. Um, but they also have a lot of really fascinating films and photo slideshows that also tell you stories. We like stories. I think we're going to get some stories today. We got a guy here. He, he has this thing about climbing mountains. Um, David Brashear, he's executive director of Glacier Works, a famous mountaineer and photographer and filmmaker. He's climbed the Himalayan, Himalayan mountains only five times in the past three years. Now, Pretty fit guy here. Are you ready to take on DC? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. Um, he's, um, I mean, you know, I'm trying to be perky and cheerful because uh, some, some of the things that they're going to talk about today are maybe not necessarily that cheerful, showing photos of the melting glaciers um, that, you know, that, that, that you've witnessed over the years, that he's witnessed over the years. And then we have Dr. Hasnan, who um, is a scientist who's also slowly becoming more of a policy man here in D.C. You've got to watch out for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and he's going to be talking a little bit about, you know, really why the flooding is happening and what are some ways that the region could move forward in terms of data sharing. And he might even take a few policy questions, too. So, you know, he's a scientist and policy man now. So I'm going to, um, I guess it's Eni Orville's going to go. Going back to Orville. Oh, since, no, since original plan, Orville. You know, when he comes to town, he gets hijacked by people. <laughs> they almost hijacked him away from the meeting we brought him down for. But he is here, and I'd like to invite Orville to come on up and um, 
do your stuff. Great. Uh, you want me to come here? Or Anywhere I you think this will be fine. Um, well, listen, I'm going to be very brief. Um, David Brashears uh, and I, uh, the Glacier Works and the uh, Center in U.S.-China Relations at the Asia Society, have collaborated on this project uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think both David and I have felt that you know, policy uh, seems to be getting less and less traction uh, as government seems to be more and more paralyzed. And so we thought, what else is worth doing? And we thought the kind of narrative of the expeditions that uh, David has been on uh, might be uh, the best way to actually show some of the consequences of uh, climate change, elevated temperatures, and all of the repercussions. And what I think is so striking for me, someone who's been, uh, you know, working on China for a long time and did some time, uh, uh, wrote a book on Tibet, was that this, this part of the world, which for so long was considered to be pretty much uh, an irrelevant wasteland with certain romantic overtones uh, because it was remote, has suddenly loomed on the horizon as really the center of the whole proposition uh, of Asia's hydrology because of all of the rivers which uh, find their headwaters in this region. And this amazing system of frozen reservoirs, the, these glacial ice systems that you will see in the most amazing pictures that, that, that David has taken comparing before and after uh, photos of what's happening to some of these glaciers, not all of them to be sure. So th this is a really interesting topic, and some of the science behind it, uh, Dr. Hasnain will, will talk a little more about. Uh, he is a glaciologist from India at the Stimson Center. Uh, David, uh, he hasn't been to the Himalayas five times. He's been to the top of Everest five times and uh, shot the IMAX Everest film and is a really superlative photographer. And he began to, to wonder why as he returned again and again to these mountains, was he noticing the, this, this change in glacial ice mass? So we started uh, this project, and you'll see some of the results of it. They're quite striking, uh, and we hope we're taking a big exhibit um, of his photos along with some other photos of Chinese photographers to Beijing and then ultimately elsewhere around the world to try to use this device to signaturize, to highlight, if you will, the fact that our, our inability to act, which seems to me to be profound, uh, is not without consequences now and uh, later on. Dr. Hasnain has a very interesting idea, I hope he'll talk about it in some detail, that the flood in Pakistan was in some measure due to these underground glacial lakes under the glaciers of the Karakoram and the glacial lake outbursts that filled the Indus River up. So by the time it got downstream, where the heavy monsoon rains fell, it, was, it didn't have such a, a, a great carrying capacity. This is some, a whole area of science we're just beginning to understand. But I think as you'll see, although neither David and I are scientists, I come to it through China, David through photography and, and his love of mountains, um, you know, this, these photos uh, we're hoping will help scientists uh, measure what's going on in the glacial uh, systems of these mountains and will we'll actually uh, also draw some attention to the fact that, that this uh, unbridled development, which we seem to be stuck on, is not an economic model, which bodes well for a, a long-term sustainable world. So, um, David, I don't know what else I can say by, about you, but just uh, it's yours. I'm going to sit here for a minute before I um, hop up there to run the computer, sit here next to you since we're partners in this. Um, I think one thing that's really important to understand is that uh, Orville and myself and the people on our team understand this is a big, complicated uh, uh, thing we're talking about. And this is, um, we're talking about an 800-mile um, uh, arc of mountains that have almost 30, 35,000 uh, glaciers. Uh, uh, in the different ranges that comprise the great um, Himalayan range. And just that it's in the west, you're going to have a westerly uh, flow in the winter, in the and, and the glaciers are going to get their snowfall in the winter. Um, in, the, in the central Himalaya, you're going to have the southeasterly flow of the monsoon. The glaciers get their snow um, in the summer, and the area is warmer. The, the uh, snow rain line's higher. Um, there is less snowfall. 
and and so just little things like that uh, uh, mean that this these are big systems and and um, we are starting to learn more and more about them now when we look at the glaciers it's it's easy it's easy um, for people to state that this is such a small uh, volume of uh, fresh water coming out of these glaciers to enter very large river basins. Um, the Yellow River, the Yangtze, the Mekong, the uh, Irrawaddy, the Salween, the Tsongpo, which turns, makes its great bend through Arunachal Pradesh and becomes the Brahmaputra, the Ganga, the Indus, and the Sutlej. And there are, uh, th those, their con contribution to these flows can be anything from 1 to 8 to 10 percent. But what we really need to focus on here is that their importance of into the biodiversity and other factors in these rivers is not uh, commensurate with their volume. It's, um, it's very important water for many reasons that comes out of these glaciers. One of the most important reasons is that it's a perennial flow of water. Certain areas uh, 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 in the central and eastern Himalaya get most of their precipitation in mid-June, depending on the onset of the monsoon, July and August, late September. Um, having climbed in, in the range since 1979 up in, from Pakistan, the Tian Shan, all the way to Kachinjunga, I can tell you the hundreds and hundreds of cloudless and snowless days I've spent in the mountains in the winter. It's dry uh, uh, in the central and eastern Himalaya in winter. And then it's bone dry leading right up into the onset of the monsoon. If you've ever been to India or Punjab or anywhere in, in, um, in, in, in May, it is hot and dusty. And yet, water continues to flow out of those mountains and into the river basins. And, those, and, and that is largely water from, from uh, glacial melt. Another thing is if we were to talk um, eventually about hydropower, well, if you are going to build big dams and, 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 and we are going to try and eliminate uh, carbon emissions from China and, and India, and those dams are built far upstream, um, well, they're, they're going to be quite full, the reservoirs for those dams, during the monsoon. And then there's going to be long periods when no water except glacial melt flows into those uh, uh, basins, uh, those reservoirs that power those turbines. So these are all things that we think about in this project. If there's no water flowing in and, you t and, and the turbines aren't running at maximum power, then what happens? Do you start up coal-fired plants again uh, when that power isn't there? So this water is important. And um, as or Orville and I have said, you know, we ignore whatever message we're seeing in these glaciers. Whatever they tell us about climate change, global warming, or anything else, black soot, deposits, changing weather patterns, they are um, a canary in, a, in the mine. It's a very big mine. It stretches all over our planet. And part of our work is to add uh, another small piece to this big puzzle that people are struggling to understand. And also, we're, we're quite interested in it from his work in China, uh, Hasnan's work in India, and, um, and then my uh, experience traveling across uh, this vast range. So my work is principally about awareness um, and adaptation and some mitigation because we do have a lot of good facts, although what would you say, Hasnan, um, 50 or 60 of those 35,000 glaciers have been well studied. And none of the money that we see lavished on Antarctica and Greenland to tell us over and over again what we sort of already know, um, those glaciers fall, uh, flow into the ocean. They will probably contribute to a long-term gradual rise in sea level. The glaciers that flow out of the Himalaya flow into people's farms, uh, into their wells, and, um, and we see an exploding population over the next 40 years and a diminishing water supply. And somewhere along the line, that's a real hard circle to square. So um, these pictures can also be used um, for research because we shoot them in stereo pairs. And um, uh, the glaciologists we work is at, at CU can model uh, the glaciers, uh, going back to the earliest photograph we have, uh, to the current contemporary photographs and, and, um, and tell us what was the loss of volume, but more importantly, uh, project um, the melt rate, which in many of the uh, areas we've studied, it's uh, accelerating almost exponentially. So now we'll show you a few pictures. And, uh, my show and tell. 
And I'll ask the AV folks, that was me, if, if they could lower the lights a little bit in the front so we could see the pictures a little better. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to back up one frame here. I had that up there for all of you to see. And this just came out, uh, uh, was published in Nature. This is a really comprehensive study, and I'm sorry it's so small, but that's the only slide that I could get um, off of the Internet. It's, um, but it is the, the single most um, comprehensive study about uh, water done to date, and this is their water map. If you can read that up there, this is the incident for a human uh, water security threat. Red is the highest threat level. Um, we are going to have a threat here in the Mississippi River Basin, central and uh, western Europe, uh, affluent, uh, wealthy, uh, developed countries who can deal with this threat. What really concerns us here is all this dark red band in northern India and in southern India, and then these bands over here um, uh, in the Yellow River Basin, and right there is the Tibetan Plateau. We also have a threat to biodiversity, which I mentioned. We just don't look at this um, in terms of water. We look at it in the health of river systems, which of course leads to the health of the people uh, residing on the periphery of those river systems. And again, the incident of threat to biodiversity it's as high as it gets here. Um, 340, 350 million people live on the Gangetic Plain here in this area, southern um, India, and here uh, all along uh, central uh, China and especially up here uh, in the Yellow River Basin where they're seeing large areas of desertification. So that sort of sets the stage. This is what we're uh, looking at here. Now I'm going to have to keep turning away from the mic to see the screen. Well, I don't know if I can coordinate all those things at once. I'll, I'm going to move this okay. right here. And, right. um, and that way, um, when I'm turning around, I won't lose um, the amplification. So this is the Tibetan, uh, the Tibetan Plateau, the highest land mass on Earth, average elevation 15,000 feet. It's bigger than all of Europe. Um, if we look at the great arc of, of not just the, the, the greater uh, Himalayan range, and we uh, move up here into the Tian Shan in, in northwestern uh, um, Xinjiang, then, then this is um, also an important part of our study here. The, the longest and biggest subpolar glaciers in the world are up here on the border between Kazakhstan and Xinjiang, and, and these glaciers supply water um, into the Tarim Basin. But what we're going to look at today, because our study has yet to move there, is K2 here on the border, the world's second highest mountain, uh, the border between uh, Xinjiang and Pakistan. Then we're going to move uh, down to Everest, sits astride the border between Nepal and, and Tibet. And then we're going to move further east, uh, of course, first highest mountain in the world, and then over to Kachinjunga, which is the third highest mountain in the world, which sits astride the border. It's very close to Tibet, but it's right on the border between um, uh, the eastern border of Nepal and Sikkim. And really the range ends out in here, near the old... Um, what is now Sichuan, and the Tibetans referred to as Kham. But here you can see these tentacles of these rivers reaching up onto the Tibetan Plateau. And that would be the yellow, uh, sorry, the Yangtze, the Mekong, the, the Sawin, the Irrawaddy, the, the Tsongpo becoming the Brahmaputra, the Indus beginning here at Kailash and making this big bend and flowing into the ocean here, the Ganga with its headwaters here, and the Sutlej with its headwaters here here, which of course flows into the, both the Indus and the Sutlej pass through um, Indian uh, territory before flowing into Pakistan, which is still a fairly well administered treaty until uh, India uh, wants to dam these rivers and control the flow of the water uh, into Pakistan. And of course there's the Yangtze, which begins its journey up here, and um, is that it, Orville? Yeah. Uh, right in there, which no longer flows um, into the Yellow Sea, does it? It's just a trickle. Yeah, yeah. So now let's get in a little closer. Here's what I was uh, talking about. Now again, um, why we, why this area is important for many reasons. Uh, this is a heavily industrialized area. There's uh, slash and burn farming. There's uh, coal burning plants. People. Uh, there's uh, lots of diesel trucks and factories in this area. There's um, wood stoves. Uh, uh, kerosene stoves, and a large mass of uh, this becomes airborne and flows over uh, on the westerly winds 
um, and its deposit on the glacier something called black soot, which is a new and emerging area of studying. See how that uh, affects uh, the melt rate of the glaciers. But anyway, what, what, when you have things that are this high, 28,000 feet, 29,000 feet, 28,000 feet, and everything in between, well, these areas respond very quickly to um, changes in the climate. And we started on the north side of Everest here in uh, 2007. 28, uh, 29,028 feet, uh, 21,000 feet here. So that's 9,000 vertical feet. Everything here, the, the scale is enormous. This is the terminal moraine of the main Rongbuk Glacier. Um, the way our project works is first, um, in the beginning, we were very uh, small teams. When I went there in 2007, uh, we couldn't afford the normal uh, Sherpa teams we bring over from Nepal, so I hired two monks from the Rongbuk Monastery at 16,200 16, feet, but since they grew up carrying water and firewood there, um, I didn't have to worry about their fitness levels. So we started up the glacier. You immediately see the devastation here. Um, I'm not a glaciologist. Um, Professor Hasnan is India's leading glaciologist. He can tell you that large standing pools of water in glaciers really uh, are signaling um, the end of the glacier. And, um, and yet we wanted to go up further uh, and do this match photography. So the basic premise of this project is very simple. Um, oftentimes the first data point we have of any glacier is not a glaciologist with a theodolite or um, uh, with a GPS device or with a spirit level looking at the glaciers. They were very curious about glaciers uh, in most of the 19th century. They had no idea we'd be looking at them the way we look at them now. So they recorded them on maps and they recorded them with photographs. So what we seek is the first data point that you have of a glacier. And everywhere we go, that I go, it's photograph. If I can find the first photograph, and that's the first photograph ever taken, the north side of Everest, when the British went there in 1921 on a reconnaissance expedition. They knew the mountain was, well, back then, 29,002 feet high. It was a place on a map. They didn't know what it looked like or how to climb it. So they launched a three-month expedition to map it, and photograph it. So we start out with that. I get, I go into an archive. I know the archives because I've been crawling around these archives for 30 years. Find the photograph and then try and figure out where someone like George Mallory, the man who said because it's there, who died high on Everest here in 1924, um, I try to find out where he took the picture. And when I do, I end up with a picture like that. Uh, standing there with his picture and, and, I, and I line everything up and then I take my picture. Now what, um, Orville and I and our team are working on a very advanced website, but for now we like to keep things simple. And so the easiest thing instead of us building a line in here is just have you watch that right there. And you really need to pay attention to that because then you can see uh, where the glacier was and where the glacier is. I'll show you again, and throughout this, uh, I would also ask you to remember, if you're not glaciologists, that this is a type D glacier meaning it's debris covered. It's a massive, slow-moving conveyor belt being fed in its accumulation zone. That mass is pressing down and shoving the ice down. That's why we have Yosemite Valley. That's why we have this valley. A glacier carved it out. So here, underneath this six inches of debris, is a glacier. I'll show you one more time, and then I'll give you some scale here as we go through this. What's, what we try to concentrate on is um, not, not, we're not concentrating on the tongue of the glacier or the snout of the glacier. Uh, those areas can actually uh, uh, vary um, horizontally in ways that do not reflect the loss of mass as the, as the uh, glaciers in the Himalaya tend to ablate mostly vertically. Also, the tongue is way down here. The true health of a glacier is found in its accumulation zone. No accumulation zone, no glacier. So that's what we're looking at here. And now let's go um, look at some scale. We'll go in a little closer. You can pick your point. I tend, and you can see, well, a lot of ice has been mass, a loss. So you have to ask yourself, how much ice has been lost? Well, we, we stand here and here. Oh, sorry, not up there, down here. It's hard work. And we take laser range finder measurements so that what we add is not just this picture then and now, but we give a stereo pair of this location and many, many measurements for the scientists to use to calculate the loss of mass and the rate of loss. 
but also just to show people, like the people I normally talk to in rooms like this, the scale. Remember, the glacier was there. It's now here. So keep your eye on this pinnacle to see how much ice was lost. And then if you look on that pinnacle, you'll see a climber. So these pinnacles are quite big. Many of them are twice as high as that. So this is a lot of ice being lost. And once they begin to form this shape, several things happen. Um, so much more surface area to mass is exposed to light and air and the sun that sublimation increases dramatically. And ice that may have been lost as meltwater uh, and flows down the river is now lost to the atmosphere. You know, uh, a solid turning into a gas without becoming a liquid, sublimation. Also, snowfall, if it does come, can no longer accumulate mass. It slides off these pinnacles onto this dark uh, debris and melts very quickly. And understanding how this all accelerates and what it means, well, that's what we have the professor for. Now let's go look at the West Wrong Book. Again, map makers, first picture ever taken from this area. 1921, the frontier between Tibet and Nepal. Everest, 29,000 feet. Lhotse, 28,200 feet. Nupsi, 25,600 feet. And I noticed the webcasts and some of those figures are pretty close. They're not exactly perfect. And Pumari, somewhere over 25,000 feet. This is a big glacier, um, and that's its accumulation zone. There, there, and there. Now watch this uh, rock right here, as it becomes almost twice as big in a very short period of time. And so what you see here is the accumulation zone, sorry, um, right here, marching up to its limit. And when it reaches its limit and there is no accumulation zone, uh, then you have no uh, life left in the glacier. And anyway, these glaciers are pretty much finished anyway. As you see, the accumulation zone can only go from there to there. And now it's gone from there to there. Years ago, probably 50 years before the first picture was taken, those accumulation zones were down here. Once again, that's all ice and rock under there. We can go in a little closer and just show you um, again same scale here. You would not be standing larger than that rock right there. The old glacier was here. It's sometimes more vivid if we just overlay the two and show you what's happening um, in, uh, in every glacier we, we looked at. Now, what one can't do is find a match photograph for every glacier. But what one can do is find areas that have the same exposure, the same uh, weather patterns, the same aspect, you, uh, the, same, the sun is shining on the glacier for roughly the same amount of time every day. And you can model big areas if you model a few areas extremely well. And these oblique angles and the subtlety and, and of the information and the precision of it cannot be gained from satellite-based photography. Nor are satellites on the land interviewing people, asking them how this is going to affect their lives. This really shocked me. This is Choi Oyu the world's sixth highest mountain, 26,600 feet, the border between Tibet and Nepal. Here's how a glacier is going to affect trade, a very small amount of trade, and not water at all. Because we, we try to find other ways where uh, the landscape changes when these glaciers change. The Sherpas settled the Kumbu region, the approach to Everest that Hillary followed in 1953, on the valley on the other side of this range. When Tibetans, in search of a better land, I guess, uh, 700 years ago, crossed this pass, 19,200 feet. Well, increasing, it's getting increasingly difficult to cross this path because now all the sides of this, uh, this uh, glacier here, the moraines are being held up by the side pressure from this ice. And when it disappears, the moraines collapse and fall in. And now all we see is a big um, lake. And so the path here is slowly eroding and falling down onto the glacier. I'll show you one more uh, picture. Uh, this is another photo point of ours. Uh, we thought it would be easy to get to. We saw this picture, and we thought it would take us 12 hours to climb to 21,000 feet. Of course, we didn't make it that day because we forgot to plan to cross this lake. So these are very vivid and evocative images that bring 
home to people like the Tibetans who rely on this water uh, for their crops to, to get their barley crop um, uh, to, to sprout and to, um, to germinate um, long before the monsoon breaches the, Himal the great uh, Himalayan range up under the plateau and waters their fields. And they were so concerned. And it just surprised me, it shouldn't have, um, but that they knew so much. And what they didn't know was anything about global warming or climate change. What they did know is their crops need water, and if that water's not there, they said to us, what are we going to do? And so sometimes they're part of our teams, and now we're going to quickly run over to um, Kachinjunga. This is Choi Oyu. Now, now our first photograph is eight, 1899. Sorry. Just hit that too fast. I just have to point out now we're now our first data point is 111 years ago. The important thing is we have pictures taken by other travelers along uh, of all these glaciers. So if we have uh, say a data point here, 1899 and 2007, it's just not a straight line. The, the melt rate versus time. What we're finding is when we look at other photos, the melt rate is going like that. So a, a very well insulated debris covered glacier, now a trench, um, big, um, we're now further east of Everest. Um, it just these, as we look at these glaciers, that's a big, um, this glacier is over uh, 25, 30 miles long and um, don't look here, look here, 1899, uh, 2008. Um, uh, the glaciers are here. We s uh, measured an average uh, vertical loss of mass of 350 feet. Here we couldn't even match Vittorio Sella's original photo. He he concentrated on the mountains. His lens was only so wide, so he he really wasn't going to clip off the mountains to show the glaciers. But even in here, you know, we can't see a glacier. In through here, we don't see the glacier. It's we don't see it up in there. It melted off the picture. So we'll go in tighter and show you. These are accumulation zones. This is the stuff that the scientists are interested in, much more than the tongue of the glacier. We measured all these spots with a laser range finder. We can tell scientists exactly in six or seven points here what the loss of mass is. And now we're going to move just quickly over to the Karakoram range. Oh, let's do a little bit on Everest on the south side because this is the route Hillary followed. Um, this is harder to, to see what's happening. We haven't done as much work here. This is the ice fall. This is the famed uh, entryway into the western coom. This is where five or six hundred people are camped every spring at 17,600 feet at the base of Everest. Um, well, if they're camped here in 2010, they're camped 350 feet lower than Hillary and Tenzing in 1953. But... Um, this stuff is not always really dramatic because the scale is so big. But you can watch this rock emerge. It's not a rock. It's a mountainside. And you can just pick a place in there, is where I always look, and you can just see the glacier um, completely wither away. You can see that rock emerge. We'll go in a little tighter here. Picture, the old picture is a little fuzzy. There's the ice fall. Here's all the pinnacles. And what we have to do in our work, because it's easy to come to be discredited these days or to um, maybe to be misunderstood. We want to get as much information as we can. And we can't create this data. We can't fudge it. It just sits there in this very pure form of, of evidence. And so um, that's its strength and sometimes that's its weakness. Meaning if, um, if we were only wanting all the glaciers to melt to say, people the sky is falling and we don't well some places we find they're not melting that fast but anyway here's the massive glacier near Pakistan uh, near K2 in Pakistan this glacier is the uh, great Baltoro glacier and we, we have scale here its own natural scale because there's the Duke of Abruzzi in 1910 with many of his porters he needed a lot of porters for one reason in particular he was a Duke and he had a four post steel bed that was carried along. But watch what happens to this glacier. And we scratch our heads when we hear certain scientists who have not been on the ground here and who's tried to study these glaciers from vertical photography from satellites. Well, this glacier, if you studied it from a satellite straight down, it's not going to look like much has changed. When you study it from an oblique angle on the ground, well, a lot has changed. But if you get what I'm saying, looking straight down, the glacier may be lost a little width. 
And, and so this is, this is compelling evidence to me, and I have to leave it to others to interpret and understand. And again, if we look further down the glacier, this, this, this is happening on a 50-mile, 40-mile stretch of glacier. I would have to really get out a map and, and tell you the, the, the figures. But there's porters and their little, you know, this is a big pieces of ice, but what you're looking at is across great distances here. The same thing's happening wherever we look. Um, and this, um, this glacier is a feeder glacier. Let's remember these big glaciers need their feeder glaciers. They have their own accumulation zones. They come in like, like different um, uh, arteries uh, and, and add mass to the glacier. And this one um, apparently is no longer there. So that's it for this. I just wanted to show you who's in whose footsteps we follow. Vittorio Sella took the images from Kachinjunga in K2. And there's the great Mallory in 1921. Uh, he's... Uh, I took some of the Wheeler took the majority of the pictures we use in the study. He was a map maker using photogrammetry for his maps, and we don't know who this guy is, but he definitely looks like he has an upset stomach, or something. <laughs> you know, something's. Uh, Orville, did you want me to take one minute to show two of the gigapans? Oh, yeah, fine. All right, that's our team. We're small teams. We travel light. Um, we have to. We have no money, <laughs> so. Um, and that's us. We're always, we have more expeditions planned. And in a way, because we're not scientists, um, we go places and can do things that a team of researchers can't. Um, as Dr. Hasnan will tell us, this is a highly contentious border regions. And these people are not friends. This is hydrology. Uh, these are routes where they fought wars, you know, in the Siachen. The Indians and highest were ever fought. So, it's not easy for Dr. Hasnan to get the best information from the Pakistani, Pakistan scientists. Not easy for the Indians to get the best information from the Chinese and vice versa. They still completely contest an area, a huge area called Arunachal Pradesh. All of the northeastern province of India is claimed by the Chinese. Oh, we have had some exhibits. That's the highest, world's highest exhibit, base camp, 17,600 feet. We're kind of very compulsive in our needs to get our message out. But when you have 1,000 or 1,500 bloggers and website people and twi uh, tweeters there, they come in there. Sorry, I, I know. Then we had this. Orville and I are very proud of this. Rivers of Ice, Big Prince, um, compelled Nicholas Kristof to write a column in the Sunday uh, New York Times um, devoted to our project called um, Our Beaker is Boiling. So when you stand up in front of this stuff and see it, part of our push out is, is a, of awareness is um, getting people into rooms like this where they can see it um, firsthand. And then the bigger push is here on the website um, where we're developing the latest in um, the cool tools and, and the latest in, in education. Uh, Carnegie Mellon Institute in Pittsburgh will have a conference on education devoted to gigapixel imaging is how to turn um, earth science is not, well, this art thing, they're concerned with all education, but how to turn earth sciences into something um, exciting. I feel that we've, we have a lot of good uh, uh, computer scientists, people in biomed and elsewhere. We need more um, earth scientists to deal with the challenges that are going to face this planet. And so it's not easy to get kids interested in um, glaciers in geology and meteorology unless you make it interactive. Here's one way we make it interactive. You already saw this image, right? Yeah, but this is, so this isn't that much fun yet. It's a lot more fun when you sit there like I do with my typically rolling eyes 14-year-old niece try to explain to her all this stuff and she gets real excited when we can go in and play around here on this, sorry, on this image. Now we're not done with these yet. We're just building our website, but um, we, we start to see objects and understand the ice, and we've mapped these objects so we can move around them in 3D. This is our klutzy uh, crude um, start. You'll see a lot of this type of stuff done in Paris and the Sistine Chapel and everything else. You know what? I know what Paris looks like, and so do a lot of people. And there's a lot of pictures of the Sistine Chapel. But you know what? No scientist is going to hike their whatever up here and study this and they're not going to hike here but 
we can zoom in and show them um, they can study this accumulation zone right here and and make decisions on their own and move around and just excuse me for one second because I forgot one thing here that here's what lives behind here um, this is our article but anyway thanks to Nicholas so what you'll see when you zoom in behind the new image is in certain areas you'll be able to do that all right so then you can that's how we're building this and again you can decide on your own what's going on um, and and so the more interactive we make it the more attention we get and I, I killed that image but anyway there's another one here this is a uh, you already saw that anyway this is one you haven't seen this is uh, from the glaciers of the Karakoram this was the first one when we were proud to have celebrating his 18th birthday as our assistant down in the lower camp was Orville Schell's son Sebastian so he came with us and was uh, now is very excited about all this it's just so remarkable this is the glacier I showed you when you can click say here and click down to the match photo we saw down there and and look obliquely even here you can see although it's not as unemotional as a as a satellite photograph it's it's still kind of hard to get your head around what's going on that's all ice there's K2 28,250 feet 26,500 feet 25,490 uh, feet so but what you can do is is and this is is not only make it a possible to study um, geology and let it build here for a second but you can get in here and look at the ice you know you can look at the rocks or when we're when we're done you'll be able to position yourself uh, down here where that oblique photograph was taken and move yourself down and survey all of this stuff and there's stories and videos that go with all of this so I just have one more to show you and I think I am um, yeah sorry I built the same ones the, the last one is the one that we're most proud of well Orville likes this one the most so um, we got to show this one it's considered the greatest landscape photograph ever taken but not my photograph because I'm just following in the footsteps of great artists standing here in 1910 was Vittorio Sella with his negatives that were 12 by 14 inches glass plates and um, he was with the Duke of Abruzzi so he had a lot of funding and um, and and uh, this is um, well Dr. Hasnan knows this well over that border is the Siachen Glacier and right along here are military camps and right there is the world's highest military camp because on the other side these are the Pakistan army on the other side is the Indian army 45,000 people so it's hard to share this information so anyway you just saw a point from there that's the other photo point we also have photo the same match photos from here you can see we've heard, we were we did our work we climbed up and down a lot and we have them from here that's K2 now that's a great looking mountain down there that looks much more impressive than Everest but here's what's cool is um so we can get out of this and I don't want to make people dizzy or anything is um is right here you can go down to our camp and get some scale natural scale without and and so there's our tents there's our dining tent that's my tent we waited here uh, uh, Sebastian had to go back and go to school but we uh, we waited here 19 days for one picture because the clearest season of the year was cloudy and we weren't going to leave until we got our picture and we weren't because if he and and because what lives behind here is one of those wipes we showed you and the geologists love it the glaciologists can study all of these accumulation zones and we can also salute uh, by placing an 8 by 10 photo of the man who stood here a hundred years ago we can salute Vittorio Sella and you see if when the website's done we also can tell you about stories of photography will come up on menus geology glaciology but most of all f uh, for us uh, these can be used for many many different purposes sometimes you just find the most astonishing things when you start uh, zooming in and playing um, sorry there's 
one geologist was quite fascinated with uh, some piece of rock over here. I don't know, some, something. When, there it was, this thing, this intrusion here. And then they, and, and just, he could tell his students, he, he didn't have to climb up there and look at it. It was right there. So that's, um, that's my end of the story. And um, so that show and tell is finished. Thank you very much. Oh, don't close it. Don't close it. Don't close it. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Well, 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 they'll they'll get it up again. Sorry about that. Well, I'll, I'll reboot it. Reboot it, thanks. I was silly. Wow, how many of you got a little dizzy? <laughs> no, it was beautiful though. I had to think that when you talked about the Sistine Chapel, I said this is a chapel. Yes. You're right. <laughs> it's like, and uh, 19 days extra. And one count. Yeah. So, uh, we were we we're, we're okay. We, okay. We ran out of our last goat. Our last goat was. That was when it got serious. So now we need to <laughs> The October, no, no, right there, just click on that. We're so high tech here. All right. Um, Where just, do we hit play on well, we want PowerPoint? To hit. Okay. Do you need this? So, so oh, we'll have uh, Dr. Uh, Hasnain will maybe, you know, make a few remarks and then we can have some questions. Can, uh, am I blocking the screen? Maybe yeah. I'll just thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm delighted to be here in the Woodrow Wilson Center today, and uh, thanks to the Asia Society to share my thoughts on the Himalayan glaciers and, as the topic says, uh, the flooding and drought crisis. So if you look back at the uh, global climate negotiations are gridlocked, and uh, we have seen that uh, the Copenhagen in last December, 196 uh, head of the states were gathered, but uh, without any tangibles. And they come out uh, with a statement, political statement, that we are all concerned, but uh, there was no, uh, 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 no agreement on the greenhouse gases uh, emissions cut by each country. And recently we saw that even the U.S. Senate has uh, blocked uh, the U.S. climate bill and that is the whole global community was looking forward that if U.S. Uh, passed out that, then the China, India were forced to do that. But uh, that also failed. So now we are in a situation that we are coming to the next uh, global summit in Mexico, but I don't think the people are depressed and nobody is looking forward for that because nothing is going to happen as the U.S. has failed. So who is going to? Uh, uh, going to cut down the emissions. So emissions will continue to grow, what we call the greenhouse gases uh, blanket, which is covering the entire earth, is thickening every year, and there are more and more problems are coming in the different parts of the world. So Himalayan glaciers, uh, uh, as uh, David, uh, and you have seen the amazing pictures, which as David has shown from the Himalaya, and he has already said that uh, uh, you know, uh, these are the important uh, area because it's feeding more than 2 billion people and the water security for this region is uh, extremely important. And that is what, uh, if you look at the both North and South Pole on the penguins or, or, the, or the beers are the most important, but uh, that is also increasing the sea level. And we have seen uh, the reports recently about the North Pole, how it's melting in the summer ice, similarly on the Western Antarctic uh, ice sheet is also melting fast. So these are the mid-latitudinal glaciers, uh, and naturally they are melting much faster. So I just uh, uh, talk about that a uh, little bit about the science, but at the border of science, because I'm not going to uh, give you more scientific facts, uh, but talking about that, how the science plays an important role, and we have to have a, a kind of information, how these glaciers are melting, what uh, the database we can create about that, and then how to do the adaptation, because the mitigations we cannot go, uh, do, because mitigations already, the whole global community is required, and, uh, and we have failed many times, uh, but adaptation on regional assessment of the climate change is important, and that is what we are looking forward. Recently, I attended a science and technology and society forum in Kyoto, and that was the emphasis in that also, that let's do the 
regional assessment of the climate and try to bring the local leaders on board and the communities and try to adopt with the changing which is happening all over the globe. Yeah? Wait, I think maybe the other one. <laughs> we gave you two. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So did, not, that oh, yeah, it has gone. That turns it off. Just put this one forward. Oh, yeah. It's okay. Thank you. So look at this picture. Uh, say Tibetan Plateau is the center of the whole activity because most of the glacier, most of the rivers, whether you look at the Indus River, which is also originating in the Tibetan Plateau, and look at the Yellow, Yangtze, Mekong, Salween, and of course the Brahmaputra is goes parallel to the Himalayan uh, axis and then take a sharp turn into the Arunachal Pradesh in India and comes back to the, uh, you know, flows into the India. But there is a lot of monsoonal activity on this side, so we get a lot of uh, water during the rainy period. But what is happening now? You have seen that Pakistani floods. Why the Pakistan floods happened this year, not earlier, in the last uh, 100 years' history? Because that uh, greenhouse gases are making a big impact on the, on the monsoonal variability. Now monsoon is having a very extreme events, and certain places it is falling, uh, is having a more rain, and certain places is less rain. So this year, unfortunately, Western Himalaya, or Western region of Indian subcontinent, experienced a huge rainfall, and which has impacted not only Pakistan, but also the northern India, the Delhi, and other places. But at the same time, the eastern India was drier this year, and there was not much monsoonal precipitation. So this is are the kind of a scenario, and look at these rivers. Pakistan is the only one river country, and that is the Indus, which flows uh, uh, from Tibet Plateau, then goes through the Indian Hell Kashmir, then the Pakistan, the northern areas, and flows down. And this is a Kabul River, which is coming from the Afghanistan region, and this is also a glacier fed. There are a lot of glaciers in the Kabul headwaters. And there is a Swat River, which is... Uh, also caused the havoc this time because it is feeding all the melt waters from the big large glacier which uh, David has shown to you. And this is the Ganges here, also fed by that. And here we say that 45 to 48 percent of the melt waters coming by the snow and ice. Similarly, about uh, 9 percent in the Ganges and 2.7 percent, uh, 27 percent in the Brahmaputra. So it is an important. Uh, uh, important, uh, you know, uh, these uh, snow and ice uh, components are important for the sustaining the flows in these kind of rivers. So that is what is happening now. Hey, what is, why is it not increasing? Point it at the okay, I'll, I'll do it. Okay. So uh, the transfer processes drive the hydrology here. And you look at this uh, compounding impacts of the global and the regional climate warming, both region also affected. This is a global, the greenhouse gases, uh, the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. But this black suit is also impacting the region. So there is a monsoon rainfall variability and rising emission of black carbon aerosols are accelerating the melt of ice and reducing the accumulation. As David is uh, talking about that the accumulation is reducing or is thinning out is because of the snow is coming less during the winter time because it takes a while for for winter to for, for snowflakes to become uh, the ice crystals and that's why these glaciers leading to significant loss of ice mass and large portion in the mountain regions that is happening and you have already seen uh, these pictures which is indicative that how the ice mass is being. But it takes a while because there are huge glaciers, more than 30,000 glaciers, huge mass. It will take a while to completely melt out. But some of these glaciers which are across the Himalayan axis are melting faster than those who are parallel to the Himalayan uh, axis. So look at these uh, major weather systems are playing a very important role uh, in the sustaining our growth or shrinkage of these glaciers, and look here, these are the westerlies, which brings uh, snow during the winter time, between just like here, uh, October to November to January, February, or April, and uh, rain into the plains of the North India. Similarly, the East Monsoon, river, uh, uh, monsoon System also uh, is penetrates into the eastern portion of the Tibetan Plateau, and then it takes a turn, and we have a huge rainfall because all the uh, 
is more than uh, you know the hills uh, or the mountains have a average elevation is 7000 meters so most of the rain falls here and uh, some does penetrate into the eastern portion and similarly we have the winter monsoon system so all these glaciers are controlled by these weather patterns so that's why we have a large glaciers on the western side and the smaller glaciers on the on the eastern side and these glaciers are higher uh, uh, at the uh, you know in the elevation then these glaciers are in the lower in the elevations so but look at these important glaciers on the eastern side which is feeding to the brahmaputra and other rivers what is happening that that the accumulation and the ablation takes place during the summer time at the same time so it is very delicately balanced with the regional temperature if there is a change in even a half a degree temperature then there will be a lot of uh, rainfall at the higher elevation and less snowfall on the higher elevation and this is what exactly happening on the eastern Himalaya. That's why all the glaciers are show, showing the negative mass balance and uh, very few having some dumping in the winter time but it comes in the late in the winter time and melts out quickly. But on the western side some of the glaciers uh, as big glaciers as in the Pakistan Karakoram and even the Indian Karakoram are uh, having large, uh, you know, dumping during the winter time. But recent times, in the last five, ten years, we have seen that dumping is there, but it is, uh, it is not uh, increasing the mass of these glaciers. So why the mass is not increasing of these glaciers? The main reason that is coming late in the winter time, and as he has said that it is a dry period, sometimes it is variability of these westerlies and the easterlies, which we call them, and that is the main controlling factor of that. And that is what we have seen recently in the, uh, this is the, uh, you know, last uh, year I was traveling by this Lhasa to Beijing train. You see that in August time, how is the Tibetan plateau uh, permafrost is melting. It's a huge melting of the permafrost. And that train, which goes from Lhasa to Beijing, travels 500 kilometers through this permafrost. So they are having a major problem how to stabilize their track because it is going down and down. And that is another uh, engineering uh, way they are finding it out they are putting up with some uh, liquid uh, ammonia in that and kind of a thing they are doing it the Chinese are doing good job in that so look at this uh, uh, Pakistani flooding and the Indus River see 2,000 meter upstream area about 40 percent of the stream area of this Indus River is about 2,000 meters elevation and this is the normalized melt index uh, calculated means the upstream discharge divided by the downstream discharge. So the generated, the Q, or the discharge generated by snow and ice melt is about 151%. So the majority of the, the flows coming into that by the snow and ice, and that uh, the total discharge of the glacier is about, and the total glacier cover is 2.2% as the uh, area is concerned of the Indus River. From the Indus point of view, the snow and ice is the very critical component into their flows. And if you remove these components, then there will be a less water coming in that. So the Pakistan was uh, complaining to India mostly because, as we know, that we have a 1960, uh, the World Bank brokered uh, treaty between these two countries that there is no water. India is stopping the water. But after this flood, they're saying that their India has released more water from the reservoir. So there will always be a problem between these two countries. So no, so no matter whether it's less water or more water. But the truth is that, that these glaciers, all glaciers are melting fast. But earlier in the last 10 years or 20 years, not much monsoonal precipitation is taking place here. And all you see these green, green places, they are the smaller uh, reservoirs. They made it or a kind of a pondage of the water, they put it here, and they're all uh, having, uh, this is the Tarbela Dam, and this is Mangla Dam, there's the huge uh, dam the, uh, the Pakistan government has created after independence, and they're all uh, silted up because of the huge sediments are coming up, so they are carrying, their capacity is reduced. So if there is a more discharges is coming, so naturally they are going to spill out, and that is what exactly happened this year. And these all these barrages, what they call this also, it's not that the monsoonal rainfall, you must have seen the 
pictures that even the rain was stopped, even the flooding was continuing because there was a spilling out from these barrages. The water, because their, their capacity is reduced enormously because of the sedimentation. So this is the kind of a situation here. And earlier, I know because I was working in this region that a lot of water is coming to that, to Pakistan rivers. But, and even in the drier period, they were diverting the water from the river, say, uh, from uh, Chenab, they are diverting the water to the Ravi. Ravi is uh, under the Indian control because of the treaty. And uh, so that is what they were doing earlier. But now, because of this uh, uh, monsoonal precipitation, which happened exceptionally high, so the problem has just compounded and is giving a lot of flooding. And this is the uh, picture of uh, the areas which is flooded. About 20 million people were affected, and a lot of uh, huge uh, 1.25 million square kilometers has been uh, you know, deluged in this region, entire region. So it is not only the Indus River which has created havoc, all these glaciers. So what is happening, I will uh, to explain you what, what is happening to this glacial system, why the water is released uh, all of a sudden from these subglacial lakes. And then, uh, because uh, in most of the, uh, in the Swat River Valley, the water has gone up to the 10 meters high and it is by the sudden release of the water from the glacier, and then you had at the lower region is the rainfall, and that is what creating this kind of a flooding uh, this year in this uh, western Pakistan. Similarly, we have this uh, Indus River, and Indus River uh, also flowing to that, and is more than two, uh, about 27% NMI that normalized melt index is uh, and it is 68% uh, is about 2,000 meters, and glacier cover is 3.6 meters. These two rivers are very important. Uh, the China is, is trying to build up the dams in the bend here now, and they are trying to divert the water. They already started this program, and India is already pro, uh, complaining to them, and they say, no, we are not doing it. But exactly if you look at that, they are doing it here, and similarly, they have built up many, many dams on this river, which is coming. And this is a very important river from the China, China's strategic point of view, because this is the water they have to take it to the northern regions because of the drier. Uh, they, they need a lot of water, and urbanization is taking place huge there. And they have a problem in the agriculture sector. So they, they, they are more interested on the eastern Tibetan Plateau River than the western Plateau Rivers, because they cannot use that kind of a water. So the black carbon playing a major role in the Himalaya, the main contributors of the black carbon, which I was talked earlier, that the regional climate is also playing an important role. And look now uh, that this our planet is going to have by 2050 9 billion people. 40% of them are going to be urbanization, and that is coming from China and India mainly, because we are having uh, say in India has grown, 300 million people has grown into the middle class, and everybody is bu buying a car, everybody is having a flat, and that is the kind of a change. And similar changes we have seen is a huge population in China. So China and India are contributing more uh, to, the, uh, to the greenhouse gases, and we are putting up a lot of uh, uh, coal-fired power plants. Similarly, the China has put up a lot of uh, coal-fired uh, power plants, and that is how uh, these uh, black carbon is creating a problem. Another source of black carbon is the, is the huge army prisons between China and India, India and Pakistan. And all these trucks, you see that all these trucks are using it. This all emission is coming out of that, and there are thousands of trucks which are bringing their food and stuff or the army material in the heart of the, in the Kashmir Himalaya or in the Sikkim Himalaya because of the China forces are there, Indian forces. So this is the area which is uh, having a lot of uh, conflict. And uh, there is no conflict, conflict resolution in the, in the near future, but it is happening, and then it, we are having a water issue, and that is also the tension is building up between India and Pakistan and China and India for the sharing of these waters. So look at this. Uh, this is a Pakistani glacier picture, and uh, look at this. Uh, this is a Gulkin glacier. There's a huge glacial lakes for developing. So there are two kinds of the uh, glacial lakes in the Himalaya, which, which are visible and which are not visible. They are the subglacial lakes. And in 2008, 
uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, the, it was flooded and uh, it failed. What, what, oh yeah, sorry. So look at this. Is the UNDP uh, released this kind of information? Say how many glacial lakes, uh, glacial lake outburst floods we call the GLOF. Say 677 Bhutan, Nepal, India, and Pakistan. 5,218 glaciers and 2,420 glacial lakes. 52 are dangerous, and that is what happening here. And this is in the entire region, as uh, David has said, that a lot of uh, power projects are coming, and about 15,000 megawatt plant power uh, sector is, is doing a lot of businesses, but they don't know that the glacial lakes are sitting on the head of that, and someday they, they failed, and then the whole thing will be washed out. So this is another uh, kind of a problem, because those who are making these power projects, they are not concerned about this uh, environment, they are not concerned about the climate change, they are going to make a quick buck, they thought, and they are, they are involved in making these kind of a thing. So look, this uh, gl uh, gl uh, glacier flood in 2008 in the Karakoram Himalaya, and you have seen that it also devastated, but at that time in 2008, there was not much rainfall, monsoon and rainfall, so they have not felt that kind of a problem which they, they, uh, they experienced this year in 2010. So that is the reason where these things are happening. Now, this is the uh, picture of my friend. You, you see this is the glacial lake, and it was the 627, and on 716, this glacial lake is vanished. So where the water is going? So all these water is from the Batura Glacier of Karakoram. It's very big glaciers, about 30 kilometer long glacier, very important glacier. And the melt water is feeds into the Swat River, uh, which uh, created havoc this year in the Himalaya. And look here, the all water is going to subglacial condition. So they are the huge glacier, the big subglacial lakes are formed. And when the, gla uh, the water pressures develop, so there is a decoupling between the ice and the ground, and the, and the, uh, and the ice mass is surges forward. So that's what we call them as surging glaciers. And you must have heard or read that Pakistani Karakoram glaciers are the surging glacier, and they surges forward. Sometimes the, the snout breaks up, and the water releases from the subglacial condition. And this is what exactly happened this year. And that is, uh, you know, the water level has gone up to the 10 meters. And then you had a rainfall, and that has created a deluge into the plains of uh, northern Pakistan. So what is the uh, Copenhagen Accord? As I said earlier, is a political statement. And they have said that we'll keep the global temperature at the two degree level C. But what happens to the, that translate into the 2.5 watts per meter square. So the dilemma for the policymakers is now that if the planet already trapped 2.6 to 3.5 uh, watts per meter square radiated energy, so we have already exceeded by 20%. So, and, and we know when the U.S. is not on board on the climate negotiation, so who's going to stop the uh, greenhouse gases? So that is the biggest dilemma the world is facing now, and where it is important that we have to see that how to stop this thickening of the global, uh, thickening of this already a blanket, which is already every year we are thickening it, thickening it. So what will be the future of the people we are living on this planet? So uh, one way forward, which we thought it is the only way to go, is to create knowledge action networks. So if you call the knowledge action ne networks, it is a, a, is a kind of a two-way information, because that is very important to do it. And that uh, we have to involve, as I was talking about, uh, this uh, uh, adaptation and involving the regional assessments, the local communities, the scientists, the decision makers, and their regional and national and global counterparts. So it is a bottom up approach is cannot be top down approach because earlier in the Copenhagen we seen the top down is totally failed so we have to come up with a bottom up approach and this is the only way so what is the functions include the understanding of ongoing natural and social impacts of the climate change characterizing the risk of the future climate change to the to the local community, because if something is happening, uh, you'll be surprised and delighted to know that many communities in the Himalaya 
are naturally adopting to the change. I've seen in the Kashmir Himalaya, they used to have a lot of paddy cultivation in the Kashmir Valley. Now they are shifting to the orchards because that consume less water and they are getting less water. So that is the kind of a human society is, since time immemorial is already changing with the uh, changing climate without telling that, okay, they, they, they may not be aware about that, but they are doing naturally. So that is the kind of indigenous knowledge which we have to incorporate in our uh, climate uh, negotiations. This is very important, leveraging the existing resources and program, providing information flows to ensure that interrelated decisions can be made at the global and regional and local levels. Building capacity, that is very important because in certain particularly in the Himalaya, uh, South Asia, the capacity is very low, and the, the scientists are, as you have seen that, because you have seen, this is a huge uh, task to measure uh, the mass of a glacier and going to an accumulation zone is not easy for a scientist, so they are mostly resorting to this kind of a satellite imageries, and satellite imageries uh, cannot give you the exact answer to the scientific, so you have to have some benchmark glacier where you measure every component of that, you, you go to the accumulation zone, you dig up and you know how much is the density of the various ice layers, then you do the mass balance, uh, you, you have to dig up uh, these uh, stakes and see the, how much is the changing is occurring in the accumulation and measure the discharge and then you develop the model and whether it's a hydrological model or a climate model, but you have to verify your model with the real time data. So this is the area which is the real-time data is lacking in this particular region. So the translating scientific knowledge data into a local, locally understandable and usable form. That is very critical for the communities uh, to involve or the NGOs to be in that uh, particular region. Then uh, uh, communication, uh, communicating the need for a nature of adaptation action and culturally appropriate ways. Because the globe is so different. It's not like... U.S. or Europe or Asia is so different in different regions of the world, whether in Africa or Asia. So you have to have that kind of a adaptation is culturally appropriate ways. Until you do that way, it is not going to work. So similarly, the promoting the development by the international community of technical system that can be applied to or operated at local level, relaying local knowledge to the regional, national, international communities, supporting local leaders as they implement adaptation actions. So uh, because the, the community uh, or the decision maker at the local level are smaller than at the global level, which is very difficult to bring them together and create a mitigation. But at the local level, it is possible. So that is why the, uh, it is emphasis to do the regional assessment and do the adaptation. At the end of the spectrum, there could be a one impact, one region network, and say, for example, the impact of climate change on water availability in a single watershed. So if it is a watershed of a Indus River system, so we can have a knowledge created within India or in, in Kashmir or in Pakistan, and that can be shared and can develop a kind of adaptation how the communities, because we are going to live there, Climate change is going to grow, so we have to find a way out for doing these things. So this is the way Knowledge Action Network can work uh, to, in, as the world leaders are failed, but this can work if the regional leaders or regional scientists or regional communities are agree for doing this kind of thing. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Well, why don't we, uh, we'd be happy to entertain uh, questions uh, from any of you uh, to any of us. And I, and I should would say I want to thank uh, the Asia Society, uh, Jack Garrity, and Jennifer Turner, and the uh, Wilson Center for having us down. Uh, we really appreciate your, both of your efforts. No, I mean, come on, an opportunity to have, like, dizzy pictures and somewhat, well, I mean, there's a, there's a, I, I appreciate your optimism there at the end about looking at the bottom-up types of solutions. I fancy there are questions. And when, you, um, you, when you're handed a mic, Kushin is right there. Where's, uh, I have a hand right here in front. And um, could you just say your name and, and where you hang your out during the day? It's always nice for people to know. Do you want a piece of paper? Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa Friedman. I'm with Climate Wire. And thank you for doing this. This is so interesting. Um, I'm also interested in these, in these knowledge action networks. But if for someone who is, and forgive me if this is rudimentary for a lot of people in the room, but for someone who's not 
knowledgeable about Himalayan politics. Um, <laughs> could, <laughs> could the three of you talk a little bit about what makes information sharing and studying so difficult in this region? What are some of the politics playing out between countries on, on water wars? I, I'm curious, is there, I mean, do countries have valid concerns about, you know, is this just nationalistic paranoia or, or can information be misused by countries? And, and maybe are, <coughs> you know, what are you seeing maybe in these knowledge action networks but, um, or elsewhere where things are happening, where, where there are some really good examples of countries doing something new, sharing information, working together, where are there glimmers of hope? Thanks. Well, I'll just talk one little thing, and Orville probably will talk about the politics and his work in China, and then maybe yours in right. India and Pakistan. The way th our project, will, where it will live, is on the Internet, on a website. It's, um, this doesn't seem to be too pol politically a contentious an, an issue in, in China. They're hungry for this information, um, and uh, there is not much censorship of the Internet in, in, uh, for a site like this in India and Pakistan. So eventually we want to create a site where uh, people can go to for really uh, good information. And it's uh, be presented in a non-polemical way. Um, we're not just going to, we're not going to hang our hats on the problem is all, uh, you know, anthropomorphic causes of uh, global warming and climate change. There's a lot to be uh, figured out there and it sets you up to be an easy target. Um, uh, we it will just echo the sentiments of, of uh, Professor Hasnan in that it, it's there's going to be a lot more carbon in the air in 20 years. There's just no way around it, no matter what technologies come in and what form and how they're deployed. So um, the more that we can get this information out and get it um, uh, in an evocative and emotional way to whoever it is. Uh, believe me, the Chinese are, are really up on this, and they see these pictures, and Chomolongma is in Tibet. They have tremendous pride in that mountain in the region. They took the torch to the top. Uh, during the Olympics, right to the summit. Remember, the torch went to the summit of, of Chomolongma, of Everest. So they're aware of this. The images get people's attention, um, and that's what that's what we're um, up to. And then and then from seeing these images might compel policymakers and others, or the or ground up folks to to uh, uh, you know think about things and move towards adaptation and mitigation. So there you go, Orville. Well, you know, I think it's important to remember that an awful lot of these countries have been at war with each other. I mean, China, Vietnam, China, India, India, Pakistan, I mean, one could go on. So there's an awful lot of natural uh, sort of geopolitical divides. And also, Tibet has sat sort of in the middle of this whole area as a kind of a neutral zone for, for you know, centuries. And so uh, it happens to be mostly Chinese sovereignty now, but uh, everybody has a piece of it. So this is, this is going to be an incredibly fraught region. Uh, and there's still a lot of territory contested in China, India, India, and Pakistan. So, um, you know, when you talk about the security issues, I mean, we have just barely begun to have the dimmest consciousness of uh, what this is going to mean in, in the future. I mean, we're going to have, uh, we've seen one in Pakistan this year, we're going to have floods in the near run and droughts in the long run. And the seasonal flows are very subtle. I mean, the Indus actually gets quite a, quite a, a, a substantial amount of water from the glaciers, but others, as David pointed out, are, are proportionally less, except at certain times of year, the proportion is very high. So you don't want to look at the annual proportion of glacial melt to one of these river systems because it's very deceptive. Just one other thing, you see, uh, Professor Hasnan mentioned the 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 river that begins near um, Kailash, um, the Tsangpo, which makes this bend through the world's deepest gorge between Namchabaro and Jalaperi. The gorge is over 17,000 feet deep. It's not so much a gorge as just a deep valley between mountains. I visited the area in the 80s. Now, that turns into an area, um, into Arunachal Pradesh, which is already somewhat contested. Not only do they, are they considering building a big hydroelectric uh, project there, but, um, and, and I wasn't aware of the fact they might want to divert that water, but because the plateau is so high, if you want to divert that water in one of their south-north exchanges, as they're already doing, then 
then you, you, you dig tunnels, but the water essentially is flowing downhill all the way. You're starting at 16, 15,000 feet. You can get that water to flow a long way by having it drop a few inches a mile. Um, look at the barges system in France. You know those those canals are, flow great distances, and they aren't, they don't change very much in elevation. So, I think we all know that uh, China is in this huge uh, global call on 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 resources. You know they the preemptive buying of mining rights and forests and and everything else out there, and. And they don't have to buy this water. They just have to stop it from flowing into another country and divert it. And, and we, you know, you can maybe find more, you know, bauxite for aluminum. Maybe you can find more limestone for um, making cement. Uh, but you can't make more water. And you can actually find ways to save energy and, and, and find other uh, forms of, 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 of energy um, than fossil fuel-based energy. But water everyone is thinking is going to be a place where you'll fight to the death over water because you can't live without it. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> you know, all these three countries are nuclear countries. Now they have all atomic weapons and all kind of things. And uh, the problem with these uh, all three countries, there, there is a mistrust, total mistrust between India and China and India and Pakistan. Say recently, the Indian External Affairs Minister went there, and then they had an agreement on sharing uh, the scientific or hydrological data on Indus. And the China said, "Okay, we can share during the rainy season only, not during the dry period." And rainy season data is just useless data they, because we're already having a lot of rainfall on the southern flank, and you don't know. So similarly, the Pakistan and India government say, "No, we cannot share data uh, because." Uh, whatever the reason they have. Uh, they don't want to share data on the, on the Indus River. So that is the kind of a, a situation in that country. And they have a bilateral agreement, most of them bilateral. So if they have to, uh, because the China is important, as you said, that the Tibetan plateau is in the center of the thing. So they have to have a multilateral agreement to ease the tension. Because the China is not recognizing Tibet officially as a part of China. So how they can have an agreement on uh, on Indus River. So that is the kind of a situation in the region, and, uh, and I hope uh, that uh, they will come around to a point where instead of sharing the water, they will share the benefits of the water. Okay, some other questions out there. Kusin, the gentleman right at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Hello. Um, my name is Jonathan Stevens, and I do applied research at the World Bank. And I've been working on the Indus River Corridor. Okay. Um, thank goodness we didn't build what we planned last year because of security issues, and it would all, all been lost. Um, uh, I'm given that we're not going to solve the policy ramifications on global warming in the very near future. We know that for every dollar of risk mitigation planning that we do in these river basins, that we save. Four dollars of uh, capital damage the first day of a disaster, not to say anything more about all of the other <coughs> economic benefits of <clears throat> mitigating disasters. Um, wouldn't it be better that we focus more using the data you guys are producing on risk mitigation uh, rather than focusing on the policy ramifications? That's the first part of my question. The second is. Other places where there are better uh, survey, historical survey data points, and I'm sure David Brashears is aware of this, is a guy named Austin Post who used to fly for the USGS over Alaska, and I'm also an alpinist. And uh, he used to photograph the glacial movements for the USGS. Um, I bet you've met this guy uh, in uh, I think Tacoma, uh, and uh, I, I'm sure that the data points on on uh, a region like that are much more well documented. They may not be exactly the same from weather pattern standpoint, but I wonder if you're using models like the USGS have already developed and comparatively using them for an analytic framework. Yeah, we're familiar with that work. It's um. We're, we're trying to get things like that started. Um, I think especially someone like 
Professor Hassan is deeply frustrated because a great country like India doesn't even have a single research institute devoted to glaciology. And um, and they um, did Jaim and Ramesh say they were going to try and fund yeah, one? Yeah, it might not happen. So, but it's um, so yes. But you know, it's it's a remote area. Permissions are hard to get. Um, aerial flight uh, permission is nearly impossible. So we're doing mostly ground-based surveys, and we, we and we're trying to feed that into the right channels, and and what modeling techniques they use. And, and this and the stereo photogrammetry and everything else, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, that's um, well, they're just getting started on that this this month. Um, the and and but to answer the first question, uh, and I'm sure uh, one of the colleagues here can answer it better. Um, well, I look at policy as many things, and so policy is a push <laughs> towards um, uh, risk mitigation. And I, I look at risk mitigation as a form of adaptation. But we all, there's a certain point where people quit staring at the numbers. The numbers are up there, and somehow they have no resonance, and no, they're not evocative enough. And so what we're trying to do is match um, these images, just not use them for the, 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 the data, which is very useful, but to say, Something's being lost. The landscape is changing. It's going to be happening faster. Things aren't going to get better. But we do have a chance to not stick our head in the sand and wait for the tsunami to hit. And because when it hits, it's not just going to be about people. It will be about people. But, of course, it will be like what we saw in the Indus. Um, I don't know where the politics are right now, but it's, it's put the military back in a fairly prominent position, hasn't it? And so instability in these regions can lead to paths that nobody knows where it will go. But it, it's one thing we do know, it's not predictable. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you know, you raised about the modeling. Uh, uh, you know, NASA is also doing a modeling, and they have all satellite data on radiation, temperature, and precipitation, and all that. It is all right. But, uh, you know, here, the topography is so much different, you know. So uh, the only way to have a kind of a set of a benchmark glacier where you can have real-time data because you have to have a verification of these models. How, you know, we, we have seen already the, G, the global circulation models and all these regional models are just way away from the reality. So all these, whether it's a hydrological, that's what we proposed in India and Pakistan and other places, at least one benchmark glacier. And for that, we have done the capacity building, how to do the measurement and uh, create a database. And that database can be used by NASA and other people uh, to verify their model. And then the regional picture will emerge, uh, whether uh, in the Indus Basin or the eastern side, uh, which can help the policy makers to take uh, appropriate policy interventions and that kind of a thing. Okay, yeah, so but the ultimate policy question is simply this. We know things are getting warmer. We know they're getting warmer more rapidly at these higher altitudes on the Tibetan Plateau. And we've talked about this country, that country, and another country. But the reality is that unless uh, this is no country's problem, no country can solve it. Mm -hmm. Every country has to get together in this very contentious area. And it seems to me the two key pieces in, in any sort of policy solution are, of course, the United States and China. I mean, if you're going to deal with the question of greenhouse gas emissions, which is what's causing this problem, any other remedies are just piecemeal, useless little parts that won't add up to much. So it seems to me that this is the area where maximum effort should be made to get the U.S. and China together. This is a potentially... We do have a common interest here. This is one of the few areas where it's indelibly clear. And yet, we've done nothing, or very, very little. So I think that's the ultimate policy question behind these mm -hmm. photographs. And, and at the core of all of this is it's a fundamental challenge to get people to change their fundamental nature, which is that we're fundamentally built to, to, to respond to short-term threats threats and not long-term perceived or Im Im implied threats. We didn't have all those warning buoys out in the ocean until that tsunami swept over Thailand. You know, we stuck their head in the sand and waited. And then, and, and so, and you know, hope springs eternal. Someone's going to turn the whole ship around and the problem's going to be solved. But we all know, know that this won't happen. The problem will, will only get, 
get worse. And, and that's, uh, uh, you know, somewhere along the line asking for a conceptual shift in how we look at threats um, to the planet and, and to governments and to stability, which is, um, and, and it just seems, you know, it's, it, one does tend to get discouraged, but there are answers, you know, to how it can be solved. I want to jump in here. Um, you've mentioned that, that so the scientists in the region are not working together. Oh, yeah. No, actually... Are they? It's, uh, it's another I'm looking for a few glimmers of hope oh, here. Yeah. This is not only the scientists, because there's not enough uh, capability in the in the certain region to do all that kind of research. So, because the technology has changed, you have to use the differential GPS to measure the locations, and then you have to go to the accumulation zone to make... Uh, dig up a hole and measure how much is the snow input is there and uh, put up a discharge station very close to the glacier. We put up in the Kashmir Himalaya and it's washed away last year, so it costs a lot of money and efforts in doing those kind of things. So there's a kind of a total failure of institutions doing it mm -hmm. because the government institutions, the universities are not working on the glacier research. The young students are not coming. So if you select somebody for a kind of a job and then he gets the edema problem at the high altitude, how you know then? You cannot throw them out. So these are the issues which I are... I want to study them, but it makes me <laughs> sick. Yeah, that, that could be a problem. What about, um, what about the uh, journalists? You know, the rabble-rousers like in the front row here. Um, do we... Um, because I, I, I know that Isabel Hilton at China Dialogue, I think, has been talking about trying to, you know, you, you, there's knowledge at the local level, you know, the people that are there. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but what about journalists? Is there any, do, is there a, f a, f a fair number of reporting on this issue? They are reporting, you know, the global journalists are also reporting, and there's a lot of things in came in Time magazine. And yeah, yeah, now I'm talking about more the regional. Uh, and globally, but uh, the, the problem is the database, because until you have a database, okay. Created. That's what uh, the USAID is asking Pakistan to have that capacity building to measure your own glaciers and create a database which can be hooked up with the NASA here to develop the regional model on the Indus River system. So like that, these are some of the initiatives that's coming up now. Uh, I hope uh, in, in Bhutan is also the same problem, Nepal is the same, India is the same problem. And but you know, what, uh, yeah. uh, th there's one other great landform melting away beneath our feet when you mention journalism, and that is the media. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's a, a very fallen state of grace of our media, not only in this country, but in many countries. Right. And so you, you think, well, how do we get out and get to the media? Well, it's just like a glacier. You get there and it's half gone. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a double problem at work here that, that, uh, in pu public information. That's my next meeting, news media oh, oh, Okay. Yes. Had, you need a microphone. Yeah, she needs a microphone right here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Danielle Métis from the Clean Air Task Force. Um, I just wanted to respond to one thing that you had said about that it really is a global problem. And, of course, climate change is a global problem. It's going to need a global solution. But it also talked about regional issues right. and regional solutions. And Dr. Asnan and also um, David Bashir has alluded to that, that there, are, there is some regional mitigation that can mm -hmm. be done. Because um, I understand there's a lot of talk about adaptation, but of course some of that is accepting that we're not going to solve the problem in time. And you both talked about black carbon and the idea that that's right. playing a big role here. Um, I was wondering if you might talk a little bit about approaches you might, if Dr. Asnan, if you've seen some attention being paid um, because a lot of that black carbon is coming from India. There's an opportunity for India to both help itself um, and mm -hmm. buy some time while the rest of the world gets its act together. Yeah, uh, you know, what's happening in China and India because of the energy demand, there's no green energies yet developed there. So it's still they are using the coal-fired uh, power plants, both. And there is a growing every year uh, because the urbanizations and the economic uh, changes which is happening. So at the moment, they are not doing any, any mitigation on the, even the black carbon. And you'll be surprised that even the, these uh, uh, trucks, uh, they are not using the filters. Mm -hmm. If they use the filters on that, so you can reduce some emission level of black carbon. And recent uh, NASA studies already indicated they had done in the Nepal uh, that about uh, 2 to 3 percent decrease in the albedo because of the black carbon. There is a th uh, 40 to 50 percent increase in the uh, meltwaters. So that is also contributing. So uh, this is one way to reduce, and even in the uh, carbon dioxide, uh, these regional countries can reduce, but they will not do it 
until the U.S. will come on board. That is a kind of a global situation. And you know one thing that's, it doesn't, that's missing here is none of this is going to happen really unless there's – what's missing is leadership, profound, focused leadership and political will because uh, black soot. You know, uh, burning dung and wood fires and kerosene, and you're a poor rice farmer in Bihar. You know, you're going to burn that supply of wood, and there, you, no matter what, it's going to be very hard for you to collect, connect your lifestyle, which is the scratch, scratching by existence, to that melting glacier up there. Unless somewhere we start with education and leadership to develop this ethos, you know, and leaders say, you know, we have to change collectively because we're going to lead you to a better life. And that better life comes from a better environment and or provide people a, a reasons to change like that thing we recently saw or well, um, this uh, hill village in Italy. Beautiful little hill village. You know, the last place on earth you would expect to see six big noisy wind turbines, you know, because they are noisy and they are ugly on a beautiful medieval town in Italy. And yet because their energy costs were too high, they got together and got these wind turbines and put them up on this ridge. And now they have more money to spend on uh, road repairs and education and, and things that are uplifting their families. So whether they cared or not, uh, not about the environment, something worked for them, that w and it was connected to renewable energy. But we all know that we can have, you know, we don't want to be dis too discouraging here, but some, if people don't step up to the plate and lead their people to, to say, this is your children and your children's children will benefit from a cleaner planet, then, then it's just, it's really, you know, you're Sisyphus all the time, pushing that big rock uphill. And you know, I don't want to play the role of Dr. Doom here, but on black carbon, it's worth reminding you all that if we solve the problem of black carbon, in other words, get the, the atmospheric brown cloud that hovers over India gone, there's going to be an immediate jump in global temperature elevations uh, of, uh, you know, <laughs> scientists disagree, one, two, two plus degrees because that black carbon, the atmospheric brown cloud has a masking effect. It actually cools the planet, too. So if you get rid of it. But it warms the atmosphere. It, well, it, it's, it very, it's very complicated. The There's, it cools it, the it, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, you know, you get rid of it, and then you, you have this yeah. other deleterious no, What effect. are the kind of gases? Because these black aerosols are there, so they absorb yeah. more energy yeah. in that. Anyway, it's very complicated. So, yeah. Everything influences yeah. everything. But it needs, yeah. It. Okay, we got some. Right side of the room is not really uh, stepping up oh, to the plate here, but yeah. The gentleman with the red yeah, we'll hat give him right. Been, oh, yeah, with the red hat. He's been waiting a long time. He's like patient, and it's and, a cool hat. And the woman in front. Is that like of a star on your hat? hat? There we go. Well, the Red Hat is the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. I just got back from a business trip. I'm the <laughs> chief representative uh, in Vietnam for a company based in Malaysia called Arteron, which manufactures water fil uh, uh, filtration equipment. You know, they make little units, less than 100 kilograms, that can do 10,000 liters of clean water, and I'm going to try to get some out to Pakistan. That's not my job, but because of the horrible flooding conditions there. Nice. But anyway, my question is, um, some of you so mentioned so cogently the role of the United States. In, I know if the United States isn't on board, for getting international cooperation on this, it's just not likely to happen. So my question is for, for people like yourselves who know so much and have such persuasive data, it's just unassailable, um, the knowledge. But do you have a, other than the knowledge action networks, which I'm, it's great, but you know, too slow, do you have a political strategy to reinforce progressives in the United States government and legislature, you know, you can name some of them like Barack Obama and Senator Kerry and all, but to actually to mitigate the influence of just bald-faced reactionaries <laughs> who just, well, and you can name them like Senator DeMint, you know, remember when he had the cold snap last oh, yeah, year? Oh, yeah, He said, oh, now Al Gore, now Al Gore's going to cry uncle because he thinks somehow that temperature <laughs> uh, temporarily lower in a little portion of the globe has something to say about the whole globe. You know, just beyond stupid. Now we have our Attorney General in Virginia who's 
waging war against I think we get the point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Let's, uh, you have a political yeah, strategy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we had it before we got in here, but... Uh, but I mean, what's the political strategy? I don't know, the political yeah. one. Boy, who we're, can answer we're here, that one? We're here in front of you, uh, showing you pictures and trying to tell you what we know. I mean, you know, we don't have a political strategy. I think each one of us has a small piece of a larger strategy, and you do what you do. And, um, you know, you hope to vector it out as broadly as possible, but um, it's... Great, you know. great and commendable, but the thing is, I just feel like something has to be more focused to... Because people, like I just named, there's many more, don't care about the knowledge because they reject it for their own selfish reasons. Well, but if I can jump in, I actually think that, you know, the project that you're doing, that you're really trying to do outreach, I mean, you're educating, you know, all of you, mm -hmm. well, that, that as the, the, the power of yeah. the people, of the public, to make your opinions on this, that you are, we are here, sitting in D.C., ultimately also connected yeah. to what's happening in there, in the Tibet and Himalayas. Uh, yeah, we, civil, we, civil society is very important. They have to come yeah. together and rise up with them. The, to say to, to... Uh, um, it, it's easy to just say, you know, it's all wrong, right? Our, the, the the climate change is all wrong. A lot. It's just, and and when and and somehow that the uh, certain groups have such a persuasive and consistent message. They're never off message. The other side is chaos, running around trying to, uh, with no real uh, message. But actually, when I look at the work we do with Glacier Works and why it's based on education and awareness is, in, in some ways, our leaders have failed us in a profound manner. Um, and, and at a certain play area, it's just hard to change. Corporate interests are very strong. Um, but I think that youth who can come up are brought up with a different ethos and uh, outlook. In, in a decade, uh, an 18-year-old could have a PhD. You know, it's 10 years. It's only 10 years or 28 years old. And, and so I, my, my, my hope is not in trying to do anything now. I mean, that's what Orville does at a much higher level. I'm dealing with the bottom-up approach that Professor Hasnan mentioned. When they got to filter up into, a, into an area where they have a voice and have strength and power. Okay. I had a question. Do you still have your question there? Yeah, I gotta wait for the mic if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I think this is probably directed toward uh, Mr. Asnain, but And who are you? I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Robert Boggs with the Near East South Asia Center at National Defense University. Right. Um, uh, Mr. Asnain, I just wonder, um, as you're probably aware, in, in this country, and in, in the city in particular, there's a great deal of enthusiasm about uh, India's uh, economic growth, mm -hmm. and a lot of enthusiasm about its demographic dividend and about you know, uh, industrialization uh, and urbanization of pace and, and so forth. You, you're aware of all that. Yeah. Um, however, I've been doing reading in the area that you've been talking about, and, I, and I've also traveled in the Himalayas a lot, and I've seen myself um, evidence of these water problems, mm -hmm. uh, of rivers that used to be uh, you know, free-flowing are now just wadis, uh, glaciers receded, um, and it just seems to me, and then we also seen the politics of uh, greater uh, competition among the states over water rights and so forth. Uh, do you share my concern that this um, very impressive uh, economic performance of India is going to run, you know, headlong into these uh, environmental uh, barriers uh, with the, the changing uh, time and volume of the monsoons, droughts, floods, and so forth? And it just seems to me that they're a lot of people um, are just not factoring in these really fundamental environmental shifts when they make predictions uh, about uh, India's economic growth. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you because uh, we are already seeing these kind of uh, problems in the Himalaya and the communities are suffering because of that. But as the story of Indian uh, economic growth goes that, it's not an inclusive one. It is a, a kind of a certain kind of a group, so, uh, you know, because we have a huge population is, is having and having the benefits of the 9 to 9.5% economic growth. We have more millionaires there, a lot of billionaires there. But, uh, but look at the, uh, the, the, the people who are living in the villages and in the remote Himalayas, as you have seen. I have also seen that for the water, uh, uh, these springs are drying up, so these ladies, 
uh, which uh, naturally in Indian culture fetch the water, they go down to the riverside, which is very deep there, and they are facing a lot of problem. And that's why a lot of the people are migrating from certain level to another regions, and that is happening there. So uh, because of our democratic system, so we cannot have like China that you can have a regimental kind of a d dictatorship and that is a different kind of a political system. So where these things are happening now. So that is a big concern for even the Indian uh, uh, intelligentsia that how and they are already airing this thing that what kind of economic growth we are talking about where it's not an inclusive one. So that is the reason. David, I think oh, yeah. Chi oh, go ahead. China, I mean, is 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 also having tremendously uh, strained uh, water resources. The North China Plain, which is China's breadbasket, uh, the aquifers underneath it are being pumped down at an alarming rate. The precipitation patterns have changed, depending on who you listen to, some twenty to thirty percent less rainfall falling. Uh, and so, what's China doing? They've launched the largest engineering uh, project in human history, the South-North Water Transfer, to replumb the whole country, to bring three canals from the Yangtze River, from the rainwater-rich south, up to the Yellow River and, and the north. And they have one channel completed. The second's almost done. I don't know if the third will ever. T but then you start getting a whole sort of other kind of knock-on effects. For instance, 10% of the, the, the agricultural cropland of the North China Plain is now toxic because of bringing toxic water from the 380-mile lake that now lies behind the Three Gorges Dam northward. So th th this is just a uh, sort of a house of, of, of cascading effects that you do one thing and then two other things happen and nobody is able to foresee these things. So it's very, very complicated and, and, and there's no easy remedy. Okay, David well, has a question. Yeah, for while Orville. you're on the topic of China, Orville, and since we know you have your ear to the ground there more than most, um, you know, when you look at the leadership and, and look at what drives them towards the steps they're taking um, to deal with the effects of climate change and, and I guess address uh, their carbon output, um, and you look at the leadership and their pragmatism, do you see that they're driven purely uh, for stability, political stability, and environment, uh, or are they driven by uh, any real care or concern of the environment and this push to gain the upper hand, in, uh, which they're doing very well in industrial level green technologies, is that um, altruistic? Are they doing it so they can have a better cleaner country, or are they doing it so they can dominate a uh, manufacturing sector? Well, I think both. I mean, I think they really do care about the environment. Uh, they do care because it's expensive. But of course, they also want to monetize things, so they concentrate on things like energy efficiency, which can be monetized rather than cleaning up greenhouse gases, which are, are, are you, you pay for. So this is just the reality of the world. It's not particularly different in China. Okay, I might have quite time for one more question. Maybe in the very back there, gentleman in the back. <clears throat> this is our last question. So make it good. Uh, my name is Sobat Sung um, from Voice of America, and uh, I just had the question to um, any of the speakers, but uh, particularly to um, um, the ge geologist. Um, uh, you talked a lot about China, India, and Pakistan um, concern. Yes, yeah, speak up a little bit. Sorry, China, India, and Pakistan concerning uh, the issue of uh, Tibet. But um, I wondered about uh, countries in Southeast Asia, um, the, especially the Mekong country, mm -hmm. who so around 60 million people depend on the Mekong River, especially in the dry season. Um, they are geographically further away; mm -hmm. they don't share um, the Tibetan Plateau, maybe except for Burma. Um, I wondered, I have two questions. One is, have they been involved um, in, in the collaboration um, in terms of the scientific collaboration, the, the knowledge sharing at a technical level <coughs> or at a political, political level? And my second question is, because they are geographically further away and they are not nuclear armed like the other three countries, is there a way they can facilitate the collaboration at a political level? Thank you. 
Yeah, uh, see, Mekong uh, already have a commission where you know these countries uh, share this uh, and have a is a kind of a platform for discussion, political discussion on the sharing of the water, and the China is not cooperating with that kind of a commission. And you have seen that problem coming in Cambodia or Vietnam and other things. The water is not going because they have already built up uh, many dams in the upper reaches of the Mekong River. And similarly, uh, there is no scientific collaboration between these countries and the South Asian countries, uh, practically nothing. And uh, they are fighting their own war and these countries are fighting their own. So there, that's what uh, I said earlier, that needs to be a... Uh, bile not bilateral, but the multilateral kind of an agreement on Tibetan plateau, because uh, when, uh, if you remember that India had a lot of, uh, uh, because when the uh, India was the British colony, the British, uh, this Tibet was the part of the British uh, protectorate, and they had a lot of uh, kind of a agreement. But uh, when uh, in, uh, India became independent and all that, they owned that kind of a agreement, but they never really done anything to protect uh, and when the these chinese armies uh, marched into tibet the u.s administration and asked india that we want to help tibet but you are the neighbor so the the prime minister at that time Jawaharlal Nehru, said no we 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 cannot annoy china at that time but the china leadership was knowing that this is going to be very important that who owns the uh, or control the tibetan plateau control the asian waters and now you are seeing that in the climate change scenario, what is happening? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> before I want to, can you, can I ask all of you to applaud these three gentlemen oh, one more time? And I want to thank all of you for um, you know really being involved in this thoughtful conversation. Strongly encourage you to go to their website. And also, if I can do some of my own advertisement, kind of relates to the last question. Tomorrow I have um, four um, NGO folks, WWF. Uh, Wildlife Alliance, WRI, and Forest Trends coming to talk about China. It's it's not it, it, the surface. It looks like China's ecological impact on Southeast Asia with investments, but it's complex investments. It's not just the Chinese. It, there's a lot involved. So if you'd like to continue the conversation and you get up early, nine o'clock tomorrow morning on our fifth floor. Thank you again for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's going to be no green on water on the plateau.